Okay, look, okay, everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us for another fine seminar. Hey, look, okay, hey, everyone, good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, I got some feedback there. Um, my name is Lauren Hayes. I'm a professor at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga in the United States. Uh, it's my pleasure to host uh, today's fine seminar. Um, before I start, I wanted to thank our speakers from last week, uh, Steve Dobson and Hannah Correa for a really fascinating talk. Um, it was the first time we, I think we had a joint talk, which worked out really well. Um, and so that was a, a fun, we really enjoyed that seminar. Uh, next week, I'm going to pull this up here and share. So next week we have Eve Davidian. Davidian is going to be talking to us about research on spotted hyenas. So that should be an exciting talk. Looking forward to that. And today we have a colleague of mine from Chile who is going to be spe speaking. Um, I'm excited to have Loreto Correa with us today. Uh, Loreto is, a, is an assistant professor at the University Mayor de Chile in Santiago de Chile. Um, I've known Loreto for, I don't know, 15 years now or so. Uh, she did her PhD at the University of Astral de Chile in Valdivia, Chile, which is sort of south central, um, beautiful town. She also did her, um, I think it's a DVM or med a veterinary degree there as well. And prior to that, she did her undergraduate at University of Australia as well. Um, she then did a postdoc uh, with my colleague Luis Evansberger at the Universidad Católica de Chile in Santiago. And her research focuses on, um, it's an integrative research program, uh, makes it really exciting. She's interested in how endocrine mechanisms uh, regulate behavior. So she's, her, broadly speaking, she's into behavioral endocrinology. And as you'll see today, she's gonna be talking about intraspecific phenotypic variation. I won't give too much away, but some fascinating work thinking about masculinization effects, how the masculinization affects behavior uh, in her study organism, Octodon degus. Uh, Loreto has published some really nice papers um, in uh, a wide variety of journals. She's published two recent papers came out in Hormones and Behavior. Also journals like Heredity, Physiology and Behavior, uh, the Behavior Journals like BEAS, um, and also Journal of Animal Ecology. So doing quite well at an early career stage. Um, and I think, I think what's exciting I, for me personally about this talk, again, is thinking about how these hormones influence behavior. You're gonna hear hopefully an exciting story about that in the Dagos. I've been really looking forward to hearing this story in, in the big context. And I think with that, I'm going to stop the share. And Loreto, uh, please, I'm looking forward. I'm glad you're here and thank you for giving a seminar today. Thanks. I shared my PPT. Okay, uh, you can see and you can hear me well? Yes, very well, thanks. Perfect. Okay, let's go. I should get time. Okay, good morning or good afternoon, depending on your location. Uh, my name is Loreto Correa. I'm from uh, Universidad Mayor and I'm from Chile. And in this talk, I will summarize uh, our my results, uh, which came from a long-term research of 11 years in a wild population of degus in the central Chile. And the title of this talk is uh, Female and Male uh, Phenotypical Masculinization and Its Consequences on Reproductive Success in a Social Rodent. I'm sorry for my English, uh, which is basic. And in this talk, I will include results from three studies. The first of them, this, includes data from five years, and the aim was to study the individual females. The second study, this, uh, also uh, include uh, five years of data, uh, but the aim was to study the individual males. And the last study, this, uh, the most recent 
uh, include seven years of data and the aim was to study the individual females, but also the potential effect of the masculinization gradient of the female group members in the reproductive success of the focal female. And um, I'm going to talk about the intrasexual phenotypic variation, specifically the masculinization gradient and, gradient and its consequences on male and female reproductive success. Okay, uh, the intrasexual phenotypical variation in males and females has been described in invertebrates and in invertebrates. And this phenotypical variation may determine the existence of alternative phenotypes within a sex where each phenotype is characterized by a suite of morphological, physiological, phys uh, reproductive, and behavioral traits. In males, phenotypical variation is more frequent and has been associated with alternative reproductive strategies, and proximally with differences in testosterone levels. In females, uh, alternative phenotypes uh, has less been studied since Intrasexual variation is not, is not associated with alternative reproductive strategies, with some exception in damselfly and some lizard species. Uh, the phenotypical variation can be continuous or discrete, and alternative phenotypes can be determined genetically or environmentally or by a combination between genetics and environment. And in the case of the, um, the lizard of uh, Libeli and Cinervo, uh, there are three alternative phenotypes in males, the uh, orange, the blue, and the yellow male. And this variation is discrete, and the origin is genetics. And uh, in the dung beetle, the variation is continuous, and the traits that vary is the, is the length of the horn. And the origin of this uh, variation between males is the environment. Specifically, um, the amount of the nutrients that the mother um, has deposited in the eggs during the development of the beetles. And in males and in female mammals, alternative phenotypes has been linked to a gradient of masculinization, existing males and females with more or less masculinized phenotype. In this case, the variation is continuous. And in mammals, male and female phenotypical masculinization is consequences of the maternal uh, environment, where the uterine environment is the determining factor of the modification of the phenotype. In this case, the origin of the variation is the environment. And two intrauterine mechanisms have been described as responsible of the male and female pap masculinization, and both are originated by differential exposition to testosterone. These mechanisms are the prenatal maternal stress and the intrauterine position phenomenon. Uh, we start with the prenatal maternal stress. If a mother is stressed during the pregnancy, specifically the last third of pregnancy, the male pup will be exposed to lower concentration of androgens, less powerful androgens, or exposed to androgens but outside of the most sensitive period. Then the consequences is the development of a male with inconspicuous male traits. On the other hand, and if the mother is not stressed during the pregnancy, the male pup will be exposed to normal concentration of androgens, powerful androgens, or exposed to androgens, but in the sensitive period. And the consequences is the um, development of a male with typical male traits. The prenatal maternal stress has been suggested like um, uh, as the mechanisms that uh, originate the male masculinization gradient in the domestic guinea pigs and in the uh, domestic mice. In the case of females, it's very similar. And if a mother is stressed during the pregnancy, the female pup in development will be exposed to higher concentration of mother testosterone, in this case, a testosterone of adrenal origin, and the consequences is the development of a female with some masculine traits. In the case, uh, if mother is not stressed during the pregnancy, female pup will be exposed to a normal concentration of mother testosterone, and the consequences is the development of a female with typical feminine traits. 
this mechanism can affect all species uh, of mammals independent of the size of the litter. Now, the intrauterine position phenomenon, in this mechanism, the testosterone origin is the, is, the, is, the, is the testes of the male siblings, and the position that each pap occupies in the uterus determines the exposition to testosterone during development. In this diagram, we have a, a, a uterus with two horns, and uh, for example, this female is located between two males. Then she was exposed to a higher concentration of testosterone during development, and the consequences is the development of, of a female with some masculine traits. This female, female, it's called 2M female because it's between two males. This female, it's located between one male and one female. It's a 1M female. And she was exposed to a normal concentration of testosterone. And the consequences is the development of a female with typical feminine traits. And this female is located or was located between two females or without contiguous males, and then she was exposed to a lower concentration of testosterone during development and uh, developed like a female with exacerbated feminine traits or feminized females. She is a 0M female because she was located without contiguous males. In the case of males, it's similar, and the more important is the position of the pap between one, two, or zero males. This mechanism can affect all mammal species that produce litters, but mainly large litters. Now, masculinization gradient uh, by AGD um, has been studied in several species of rodent, but also in the domestic pig. But studies as, as be said uh, toward females, studies have been carried out mainly in traditional laboratory animals and under laboratory conditions. Questions has been focused mainly in aspect of the development of this phenomenon. Only one study has been carried out in a, in a, in a, in a species with a small litter size. This is the case of the California mouse. And uh, three species has been studied in wild conditions. This is the case of the yellow-bellied marmots, the woodland mouse, and the alpine marmots. And in the case of the woodland mouse and the alpine marmots, uh, there is only one uh, study. But in the case of the, uh, the yellow-bellied marmots, the marmots, there are three studies uh, performed in wild condition by Monclus and Bloomstein. And um, the masculinization gradient affects the length of uh, one morph uh, morphometric trait. This trait is the anogenital distance, the distance between the anus and genitals, or AGD. And it's a morphometric trait that varies its length uh, according to the exposition to testosterone du during development. Thus, males have, have longer AGDs than females, but within sex, uh, the AGD length varies in relation to the intrauterine position and the prenatal stress. In this picture, we have um, two degus, a male in the left side and a female in the right side. And you can see in the case of the male, the anus and the penis, and this is the anogenital distance. In the case of the female, this is the anus, this is the genital papilla, and this is the anogenital distance. Uh, females, have shorter AGDs than males, but within females, the AGD length can vary, and between males, the AGD length can vary. The association between the intrauterine position and the AGD length has been demonstrated in the domestic mice, Mongolian gerbils, European rabbits, and the association between um, prenatal stress and AGD length only has been demonstrated in the domestic mice. More important, the masculinization gradient uh, has been associated to uh, fitness, fitness, fitness consequences. Uh, for example, in the case of the female fertility, uh, studies from European rabbits and Mongolian gerbils indicate that short AGD females are more fertile than long AGD females, while studies from house mice, mole middle mice, 
Alpine marmots and yellow-bellied marmots indicates that short and long AGD females have similar fertility. In the case of the male fertility, studies from uh, Mongolian gerbils and domestic guinea pigs indicates more fertility in long AGD males relative to short AGD males. In the case of the female survival probability, an study from yellow-bellied marmots indicate that short AGD females have a higher uh, survival probability than long AGD female after the hibernation process. And another study of Selinsky from Selinsky uh, in females and in males indicate that short and long AGD males and short and AGD females have similar uh, pro uh, survival probability. Okay, uh, if we analyze the information in the previous slides, it seems that uh, the short AGD female and the long AGD male are the optimal phenotype, while the long AGD females and the short AGD males are the suboptimal phenotypes. However, some authors uh, suggest that long AGD females could be a better competitors in high density conditions. Short AGD females only could express their reproductive potential in low density conditions. Long AGD males could be a better tactic in low density conditions when the intermale conflict is low. And short AGD males could be a better tactic when density and intermale conflict are high. Uh, these four statements uh, has been not um, um, proved, but some information uh, about uh, European rabbits and domestic mice indicate that these uh, statements could be correct because in European rabbits, long AGD females mate early or late, depending on the population density, which can increase the pup over winter survival. And in the case of the domestic mice, the dom domestic mice, uh, and under crowding conditions, the pup of masculinized females survive more. But what happens uh, with degus? In our uh, research of eleven years, uh, we detected the gradient of masculinization uh, by AGD in females and in males. And in females, the AGD distribution follow a normal distribution. In the x-axis, we have the AGD of females in millimeters, and in the a-axis, the frequency of the occurrence of the different phenotypes in the population. And you can see that the females with the intermediate uh, AGD length are the more frequent phenotype in the population, while the short and long AGD females are the infrequent phenotype in the population. More important, um, the AGD length in female is not correlated to the female body mass, at least in adult state. And uh, the AGD length in females have a high repeatability. In the case of males, it's very similar. Also, the AGD distribution of males follow a normal distribution in the x-axis, the AGD of males. And as in the females, the, the males with intermediate length of AGD are the more frequent phenotype, and short AGD and long AGD males are the infrequent phenotype. As in females, AGD length is not correlated to the body mass, and the AGD length repeatability is very high in males, more than in females. And uh, in a previous slide, I indicate that the AGD only can be used as a proxy of intrauterine position if an association between intrauterine position and AGD is demonstrated. Then we performed cesarean surgeries to the goose to determine the position in which uh, each pap was located. And uh, we performed cesarean surgeries to 11 females and we obtained 11 liters. And from these 11 liters, we obtained uh, 98 pups, and we know the position of each pup. And uh, we measure the AGD length of this pup at uh, birth, at weaning, and in adult state, because um, all offspring uh, survive uh, this surgery. And our results indicate that in pink 
females in blue males. And in the uh, x-axis, we have the intrauterine position, 0M, 1M, and 2M. And in the a-axis, we have the anogenital index. The anogenital index is a standardization of the AGD leg uh, by body mass because since uh, see, uh, before puberty, AGD and body mass in deus are correlated. And uh, we can see that individuals in 2M intrauterine position have longer AGDs than individual in 1M intrauterine position and individuals in 1M intrauterine position have longer AGD than individuals in 0M intrauterine position. In Degus, AGD length variability recorded at birth is accentuated and fixed during the puberty. Thus, the AGD length variability within a core remains consistent throughout the adulthood. In Deus, AGD variability can be utilized as a proxy of androgen exposure during the prenatal development. Okay, um, now I will talk about our model species. These are Degus. Degus is an endemic caviomorph rodent of central Chile. They live in an scrub landscape with Mediterranean weather in the Chaparral biome, live in underground burrow system or between rocks. They are a small to medium sized rodent without sexual dimorphism. They are strict herbivores and they have diurnal activity. Uh, Degus is a highly social species. They are not territorial. They have a promiscuous mating system and social groups vary in size and individual sex composition. And the group share the burrow and the nest during the year. The mating season takes place during the uh, austral winter in June, and the parental care or nursing season takes place during the austral spring in September. Uh, the pregnancy period is around three months, and the litter size is three more or less two pups, and pups are precocial. And females share uh, their burrows and communally rear their pups, Males provide some, but not essential parental care. The size, composition, and stability of the social groups affect female reproductive success. And despite to be a long-lived rodent in wild conditions, they will ecologically semelparous, as the 90% of the adults do, do not survive to the second year. Our general objective was to assess the effect of the male and female AGD gradient on female and male reproductive success, measured as litter size winnet or seeded at winning in a natural population of Degus. We predict that short AGD females uh, would uh, win uh, larger litters than long AGD females. And in the case of the males, we predict that long AGD males would see more pups than short AGD males at winning. In the case of females, we also assess uh, the potential asso uh, association between the AGD length phenotype with the proportion of male in the liters, the pup body mass at winning, and the date of the beard. And um, this is uh, our study population. I will summarize our methods, uh, but our population is located in the central Chile, very close to Santiago city. And this is the landscape during the winter without grass. And this is the landscape during the spring uh, with a lot of grass. And you can see a burrow system with uh, 10 traps. <clears throat> and during our field work, uh, we perform two activities. Uh, during the day, we uh, uh, made a diurnal trapping, and uh, during the night, night uh, we performed the nighttime telemetry. Uh, um, diurnal trapping and nighttime, nighttime telemetry uh, were performed uh, during the mating season between May to July, and during the nursing season um, between August to October. Each day we use um, 400 traps. We trap Degus say, uh, six days a week. We use 10 traps per burrow system and, and thus uh, we monitor uh, 40 burrows a day. You can see a, a landscape during the winter, a burrow system. This stick is the number of the, the burrow. And you can see uh, tomahawk traps and some holes of entrance to the burrow system. 
during the spring in this picture uh, we trap many degus and you can see an individual degus with his hair uh, ear tag and his hair uh, radio collar uh, each day we ear tag marking new degus We determine the body mass, the AGD length, the reproductive status. Uh, we obtain a tissue sam a, a sampling of tissue to DNA analysis, and we put the radio collar to a nighttime telemetry. And during the nighttime telemetry, um, we determine the membership to each social group, since members of the same social group share the burrow during the night. And our sample size in these studies was um, 89 females with no social group and 78 uh, males with no social group. And to determine the number of uh, aspirin uh, seeded or winner, uh, we use a maternity and paternity genetic analysis. We uh, use 10 microsatellites, nine from Deus and one from Kururo. And our uh, paternity maternity assignment were made using the strict confidence interval, accepting only zero or one mismatch. And the exclusion probability of 10 lossy combined was 99. Our statistical analysis were uh, linear mixed models, uh, where the year and the social group ID factors were included uh, as random factors in all models. Our statistical analysis were, was, were performed in R. And we only examine association between factors and responsive variable. We did not examine causal, uh, causal relationships. And our results, um, we start with females. Uh, the first results in females is female AED length was not associated to the size of the litter at winning. This means that short and long AED female have similar fertility at winning. Our second results indicate that female AGD length was associated to the litter sex ratio. In the x-axis, we have the female anogenital distance, and in the a-axis, the proportion of male offspring in, in litter at winning, and short AGD females win female biased litters, while long AGD females win male biased litters. In the case of the pap body mass, a female AED length was associated to the pap body mass at winning in the x-axis, again, the female anorganical distance, and in the a-axis, the offspring body weight at winning. The, this, sorry. <clears throat> this association is not linear, it's something like a quadratic function, but the association is positive. This means that short AGD females win a lighter a pups and long AGD females win heavier pups. And uh, in relationship to the date of the beard, a female AGD was associated to the date of the beard in the x-axis, female anogenital distance, and in the a-axis, the time interval of date of parturation and days, and the association is positive. This means that short AGD females give birth earlier and long AGD females give birth later. And in the case of the males, male AGD length was associated to the number of pup seeded at winning in the x-axis, the AGD of males, and the, in the a-axis, the number of the offspring seeded at winning and short AGD males see less pups at winning, and long AED male see more pups at winning. Now, um, <clears throat> I will introduce some theoretical aspects about the homophily uh, to explain our objectives and results for the last study, in which we include the potential effects of the AED of the female group members in the reproductive success of the focal female. Um, and from our observation and analysis of the composition of the social groups uh, in, in wild conditions, we realized that um, the social groups seems to be not composed randomly in terms of the AGD length of the females, uh, but rather in a biased way. Uh, it seems that long AGD females are together in same social groups, 
short AGD females are together but in other different groups and intermediate AGD females are together in other different social groups but some of intermediate females share the social group with long AGD females or with short AGD females. The homophily uh, occurs when individuals are associated with con specific of similar traits, in this case, the AGD of females. And um, homophily could be passive or active. Passive, when individuals of similar phenotype are together, but without choosing between them. For example, the fishes. Big fishes are in some schools and um, small fishes as are in other schools. Uh, this occurred because um, large fishes um, swim fast and small fishes swim slow. Then the segregation by size is consequences of the swimming speed. An active homophily could be active when individuals of similar phenotypes chose each other. Active homophily has been described in guppies by behavioral phenotypes, in chimpanzees by behavioral profiles, in the great teeth for behavioral profiles, in bottlenose dolphins for cultural traits, and in humans for race, religion, economical status, soccer team, musical preferences, etc. And uh, only uh, one previous study uh, uh, assessed the potential effect of the homophily in fitness. This study was the uh, Theodorakis, and he examined the um, per capita risk of predation depending on if the school is heterophilic by body size or homophilic by body size. And he found that in schools where fishes are homophilic by size, the per capita risk of predation is lower. And in the schools uh, where the fishes are heterophilic by body size, the per capita risk of predation is high as consequences of the oddity effect. And as we know that long AED females win heavier pups, female degus care and nurse pups communally, long AED females made a higher maternal investment and social groups in natural conditions seems to be homophilic by AGD length, we think that social groups composed mainly from long AGD females could have higher reproductive output relative to social groups composed by mainly short or intermediate AGD length. Our general objective was to determine uh, the composition of social groups in terms of female AGD lengths affect the effect or not the reproductive success in a natural population of Debus. And we predict that the mean AGD length of the female of the social group will be positively associated with the AGD length of the focal female. This is the prediction about the homophily. And uh, second, we predict that the litter size of the focal female will increase with an increase in the AGD length of the female group mates. And Third, the variance in the litter size of the females in the group will decrease with an increase in the AGD length of the female group mates. And our results indicate that uh, in the x-axis, the AGD of the focal female, but in the a-axis, the mean AGD of the group mates, female group mates. And the association between two variables is positive. This means that Short AGD females are associated with short AGD females and long AGD females are associated to long AGD females. Females from the same group do not associate randomly but be assessed by the length of the AGD. They got, uh, thus, a female are homophilic by AGD length. Now, the consequences of the homophily in the reproductive success uh, of each focal female measured as litter size at winning. In the x-axis, we have the main EGD of group mate, female group mates. And in the a-axis, we have the litter size at winning of the focal female. And the association between two variables is positiva, is positive. Uh, this means that um, in social group predominated for short AGD females, 
the females, focal females, win smaller litters, and in social groups predominated for long AGD females, focal female win larger litters. This variation, this variation in the size of the litter uh, of the focal female depends on the AGD of the female group mate, not the focal female. And the last results in relation to the reproductive success variance indicate that the standardized reproductive variance of litter size at weaning is associated in, in, a, in a negative way with the mean AGD of the group mates. This means that in social groups predominated for short AGD females, the standardized variance uh, at weaning is greater. Thus, litter size in, this, in these social groups is more variable. And on the other hand, uh, in social groups predominated for long AGD females, the standardized reproductive variance at weaning is less. Thus, the litter size in, in this kind of group of long AED females is less variable. Okay, general discussion. As in other uh, mammal litter bearing species, uh, degus exhibit a natural uh, AED length uh, of masculinization gradient for females and for males. In degus, the AED length variability is consequence of the differential exposition to androgens which depends on the intrauterine position that each fetus occupies in the uterus. Then the intrauterine position phenomenon is confirmed in degus. In degus, AGD variability recorded at birth and at weaning is accentuated and fixed in the adulthood, and AGD uh, length repeatability is very high and not correlated to the body mass. Thus, in degus, the AGD length could be utilized as a proxy of male and female phenotypical masculinization. In a natural population of degus, intermediated AGD length males and females are more frequent, while short and long AGD males uh, and females are the infrequent phenotypes as in the domestic mice. And um, the consequences relative to reproductive success, for males, our results are coherent with previous results from Mongolian gerbils and domestic guinea pigs because long AED males see more pups than intermediate and short AED males. Then we confirm that in degus, long AED males are the optimal phenotype. But in females, our results depart from previous results because until, uh, until now, degus is the unique mammal species in which long AGD females are reproductively more successful. Uh, results from other uh, litter bearing species indicate higher fertility in short AGD females or not differences. In Degus, uh, long and short AGD females win litters of similar size. However, long AGD females can increase their fertility at winning if during the nursing period are together with other long AGD females. Long AGD females uh, in homophilic social groups can increase the litter size mean, but also decrease the litter size variance. And these findings are an indirect evidence of cooperation. And more interesting, the increase in the mean and the decrease in the variance is consequence of the work of the long AGD female group mate, not the focal female. Additionally, long AGD females win heavier pups in wild condition, and un unpublished data in captivity conditions suggest that long AGD females perform a higher maternal investment. Thus, in Degus, there is no evidence that long AGD females be a suboptimal phenotype. More, uh, we have evidence that long AGD females are the optimal phenotype. And our results also suggest that AGD length gradient has social consequences as female degus are homophilic by AGD length phenotype. And we hypothesize that female degus are actively homophilic, thus females would look for females with similar AGD. We also hypothesize that the odors could be the signal to recognize the AGD length phenotypes like uh, happens in the domestic mice. In domestic mice, females of different AGD lengths produce uh, female and male pheromones in different quantities. 
And they will uh, have social groups that are in unstable. This means that change members permanently. And this change will allow Degus to find partners with similar AGD length phenotype. And uh, the work for the future um, to determine if the set of the different AGD, AGD length phenotypes in males and in females behave like a system where the success of each phenotype depends on the abundance and the success of the other phenotypes, we need to examine the potential effect of the AGD length phenotype on survival. Additionally, we need to assess uh, the reproductive success and survival of different AGD phenotypes, but in, in population with different density conditions. Also, we need to examine if social group size, composition, stability can act like a buffer that uh, modulates the effect of the AGD length on, on male and female fertility and survival. And finally, we need to start uh, to perform studies uh, on behavioral consequences of male masculinization gradient as studies in males are few. Specifically, there is only one study that have examined ecological effect of male masculinization gradient. This study was performed for Gutsal et al. in the Goodland mice, and he examined uh, the association between the male AGD length and the home range size. And finally, thanks to uh, Yogonda Peralta, Lucy Goyon, uh, Loreto Carrasco, Silvan Folleron, David Bellis, for all your support during the molecular work. Uh, thanks to uh, Universidad Católica for the use of the uh, Molecular Ecology Lab. Uh, thanks to Marcelo Orellana and Rosa Peralta for making it easier for us uh, to carry out our field work, allowing us the access to the natural population of Degus for 11 years. And thanks to Universidad de Chile. Um, thanks to Fondesit and Conisit for several projects and uh, doctoral fellowships. And finally, thanks to all the authors. Um, Thanks to Cecilia Leon, Cecilia Leon and Juan Ramirez for 11 years of work in the field accompanying me to measure the AGD of Degus. Alvaro Lee, thanks for um, the work in the DNA analysis and paternity and maternity assignment. Thanks to Sebastiana Vades for uh, data analysis and modeling. Thanks to Mauricio Soto and Loren Hayes. Um, for all the theo um, theoretical contributions uh, and for helping me to build uh, this research in masculinization gradient. And finally, uh, thanks to Luis Evansperger, the head of the laboratory, for all the theoretical, economical, technical support in this um, long-lasting research in masculinization gradient. Um, I hope uh, you like this talk. I hope that my basic English uh, has been not be a problem and thank you for your assistance. Thank you, Loreto, for a really fascinating talk and for putting that all into context for us. Um, and so at this time, it, it's time to have question and answer. And, and I think the way we'll make it work today, typical, please post your question marks in the chat. And I will, um, you know, tell the speaker you have a question coming. And as usual, we're going to try and prioritize students or postdocs who have questions for Loreto. Um, Adriana is going to assist with this today. Uh, um, want to thank Loreto for giving this talk in the second language. Um, so, if necessary, Adriana is going to translate. So it may take a little longer than usual, um, but that will allow us to um, continue this conversation. So. For those of you on YouTube, if you have a question, please post it in the um, chat function there and I will pass it on to Loreto. So we're gonna get started with Karsten, please. Yes, hello, my name is Karsten Schradin. I'm a researcher at the Seed Noise in Strasbourg, France. We're doing field work in South Africa on small mammals. Thanks a lot, Loreto, for really a great talk. We also started measuring anatomical distance in our new study species, the bush currents, since a few years. 
And I will definitely ask the students working on this data to first look at your fine presentation because it's such a great overview, not only of your work, but also all the all the other studies. Um, your results, like you said, or your conclusions in the end are, in, are surprising that um, both males and females seems to benefit or have higher success when they have a longer anogenital distance. And of course, you said you need more studies on to look at environmental variation. But if this would be the general pattern, then one would predict that mothers simply increased their testosterone levels generally to always increase female daughters and sons with long anogenital distance. So do you have any idea from of, or hypothesis for your future studies what, what keeps the variation below that females do not just increase their testosterone levels to produce general offspring with this long distance or masculinized offspring. Adriana? Yeah, so, okay, all of it? Uh, oh, muy bien. I need, I need, I need, I need a little of help uh, with the question of Karsten. I, 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 I understand, but not, not, not too much. Okay. Uh, bueno, entonces lo que Kirsten está preguntando es, dado que en tu estudio tú ves que las, tanto hembras como machos tienden a tener la, la distancia anogenital eh, larga, ¿cierto? Uh -huh. Y eso tenemos que esto les da mejor fitness. Uh -huh. ¿Qué mantiene la variabilidad en el sistema y hace que no todos tengan una longitud eh, larga? Ah, lo que pasa es que eh, de, de, de el origen del rasgo es ambiental. Es la posición en el útero. Entonces, si existe algún fenotipo al que le va mal, por ejemplo, los de, los de distancia no genital corta, ellos van a seguir existiendo porque el rasgo tiene muy poca heredabilidad, es un rasgo principalmente ambiental. El solo hecho de que existan una distribución aleatoria de las crías adentro del útero, determina que van a existir siempre animales que estén localizados entre dos hembras o sin machos continuos. Ok, dame un segundo, trato de responder todo eso. <laughs> ok, Carson, so basically it's because the trait is environmentally determined, and so it's going to be sort of random, based on the position that the pop gets within the uterus. So there will always have, you will always have individuals that are in between two males or between one female and one male or two females. And then you will get this um, short distance and then long distance aging. But then you will have all the variation there just because it's environmentally driven. And then the irritability is low according to Loretto's. Um, studies. Okay. Okay, so our next question comes from Sari Van Bell. Hi, Loreto. Um, thank you very much for your interesting talk. Um, I want to tell you that your English is, is pretty good, so don't you worry about that. I'm going to ask my question in English and then in Spanish, given that I also speak Spanish, so that um, I can do both of them. Um, it's a rather simple question in that, given all the information that you gave us, I want to kind of be reminded about the social system of the Degus and like how big are they, these groups? How is the dispersal pattern? With the question is, how is it that these females get together with similar length HED um, females. And I know that you mentioned that it might be some kind of off kind of small thing, but still I want to be reminded about the system. Así que lo reto, pues muchas gracias por tu um, presentación. Fue muy padre. Realmente tu inglés está bastante bien, así que no te sientes muy mal um, de eso, estuvo padrísimo. Um, mi pregunta es bastante simple en que quiero ser acordado de cómo es el sistema social de estos degus, es como que qué tan grandes son los grupos, cómo se dispersan, cómo es que las hembras se pueden encontrar con hembras similares, son, son hermanas o, o, o cómo funciona. 
a esta parte. Gracias. Ok. Eh, a ver, eh, los grupos de los degus son variables en tamaño y en composición. Eh, de hecho, no todos los degus están en grupos sociales. Hay algunos que están solos, hay algunos que están en pares. Incluso hay grupos, son muy escasos, pero hay grupos solo de machos, grupos solo de hembras, grupos multimacho, multifemale, un macho y varias hembras, una hembra y varios machos, hay de todo. ¿Ya? Y lo que sabemos es que el parentesco genético al interior del grupo no es mayor que el parentesco genético dentro de la población. Entonces los grupos no están estructurados por familia. Yeah. Eso se sabe. Y la dispersión eh, solamente la ha medido una, la medió una persona antes y eh, la dispersión lo que sabemos es que no es sesgada por sexo. Dispersan por igual tanto machos como hembras. Lo que no tenemos idea y no sabemos es la dispersión si es o no sesgada por la longitud de la AGD. Porque existen trabajos antes que han medido eso y han encontrado que los animales, los individuos, tanto machos como hembras, con la AGD larga, dispersan más que los de AGD corta, que tienden a ser más filopátricos. Pero los degus nosotros no hemos medido eso en relación a la dispersión. Pero lo que sí sabemos... por los trabajos de Luis Evans-Perrier, es que los grupos sociales son bastante inestables. Cambian mucho la, la membresía de los individuos. Entonces cambian entre estaciones y también dentro de estaciones. Básicamente los animales se mueven mucho. Se mueven tan, los machos se mueven mucho más que las hembras, pero las hembras también pueden cambiar su grupo social. Entonces lo que nosotros estamos un poco hipotetizando es que en ese intercambio de individuos, a lo mejor pueda ocurrir el reconocimiento por la AGD de los individuos. Pero cómo ocurre, no lo sabemos todavía. Wow, muy interesante. Um, should I translate the, the answer or someone is doing that for me? Um, but Loreto basically, basically said that groups are composed of any type of combination. It could be all males, all females, one male with various females or one male, one female, various various males with one female. Well, I can't remember that if that was really the case, um, but rather variable. Um, Well, that's what's the answer. Darn it, this is difficult. If someone can can help me with that translating, um, there is. They know that um, relatedness wise with paternity that there is no difference within and between groups, so it's rather a mixture. They don't have much information about dispersal, both males and females disperse, but they don't have much information about the distance and it. That is one of the next questions they might explore in that seeing if that is linked to the length of the AGD. Something else, Ariana, that you <laughs> you remember? Um. Um, no, then basically it was uh, that the hypothesis that they have is that within this dispersal between groups, uh, that's when they probably mix up all the AG distances, the phenotype based on AG. And, um, but they don't know yet what's the mechanism that allowed them to identify uh -huh. uh, a phenotype based on AG. Yeah, Loreto also said that individuals move a lot, that is both within the season and between seasons. And so these individuals are on the move constantly. And I believe it's a very interesting system. Thank you. Okay, so our next question comes from YouTube. Uh, Linda Lani Makui asks, was there an influence of litter sex composition on the length of the AGD? That is, did females in all female litters have larger AGD than females with more male siblings? Uh, in... In litters that are male be asset, females have longer AGD. And in, in litters that are a, a female be asset, all females have short AGDs. But it's because there is an, an effect of the litter and also of the mother identity. But the more important, it's, it's, it's the location 
of individuals between two males, two females, or between one male and one female. But of course, uh, the probability to be between two males or two females depends on the sex ratio of the litter. It's more probably that you can have a long AGD female in a male biased liters than in a short in a female biased liters. Okay, hey, thank you. Um, so I have a question. Uh, if there are other people who have questions, please post a question mark in the chat and I'll prioritize you. Uh, but my question, Loreto, is more about the mechanism. You know, I, the In terms of how much testosterone you're exposed to, that's going to vary across species. That's, in the degus, does that due to um, the flow of um, the direction of the flow of the in the uterine horn? In Degus, uh, I have an unpublished data, but I measured this. And I think that uh, my results indicate that uh, the, the androgen flux in the uterus is bidirectional but, uh, across the amniotic fluid, nor across the blood flux. Okay, so that would how would that influence the expression of the phenotype? I'm not sure if my question. When you have, when you have a bidirection mechanism, the position, the the position is between. It's, for example, in a bidirectional mechanism, the flux of androgen is across the amniotic fluid. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of the unidirectional uh, mechanism, the 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 movement of androgens is following the the flow of the blood is in one direction, to the uterus, to the ovario. Then the, um, the consequences in the phenotype in, is different in two mechanisms because to be a long AED female in the bidirectional mechanisms, you need to be located between two males. But in the case of the unidirectional, unidirectional mechanisms, the long AED females or 2M females is behind two males, not between two males. Mm, okay. Thank you. Um, okay, so our next question is from Eve. Hi, um, so I'm Eve Davidian. I'm a postdoc um, at the Institute for Evolutionary Sciences in Montpellier in France, and I study spotted hyenas in Tanzania. Um, thanks for your super interesting talk. I really enjoyed the to see this plasticity, this diversity of yeah, social organization and all that really uh, interesting study model. Um, I was particularly intrigued by um, the, the fitness consequences you found for, so what is it, the long AGD males, um, that it has a positive effect on uh, the number of cups of pups um, that were weaned. And I was just wondering if this was the best measure to really assess the the the, the quality the fitness um, consequences for the the male phenotype because weaning does um is influenced also by the female phenotype you know uh, because it depends also on the lactation and not that the maternal care and uh, i was wondering if you also looked at had a, a way to also count the number of pups that were produced um, or not. Uh, Adriana, can you help me? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, okay. It was a long question. Um, yeah, sorry, so... but I can rephrase otherwise, but it, it was just, yeah, um, that um, by measuring the number of pups that were weaned, there is a bit of a maternal effect in it. And yeah. yeah. Okay. Now I can ask. Uh, Loreto, entonces la pregunta va a que en, en el caso de los machos, si la medida que te tomaste eh, sobre el número de, de crías que son, que na, no que nacen, sino que... Eh, de todas. Esa, de este, exactamente, mm -hmm. bien. Um, si es la mejor medida de fitness para los machos, dado que esa medida está más influenciada por las hembras. O sea, hay un efecto materno mucho más fuerte. Sí, 
Eh, no sé cómo responder eso, porque estoy de acuerdo con lo que ella plantea, muy de acuerdo, porque de hecho tenemos resultados nuevos ahora donde... nos hemos dado cuenta que el éxito reproductivo de los machos depende absolutamente de lo que hagan las hembras, de con cuántas hembras el macho está en el grupo, que son sus potenciales parejas, y luego de con cuántas hembras el macho se aparea y tiene como, como parejas efectivas. De hecho, en, en, un, en un último estudio que tenemos ahora, estamos revisando algunos resultados, encontramos que el número de crías que el macho... Eh, De, las que el padre es macho, eh, de la que el macho es padre al momento del destete depende solo de dos factores, de la distancia anogenital del macho, pero interactuando con el número de parejas efectivas. Entonces, eh, el, el éxito reproductivo del macho depende mucho, mucho de lo que haga la hembra. Entonces, lo que nosotros vamos a intentar ver en un futuro es ver si existe algún tipo de asociación macho y hembra, de los dos que son de fenotipo de distancia anogenital larga. Porque sabemos que tanto en los machos como en las hembras, los de distancia anogenital larga les va mejor. Entonces quizás también ellos estén juntándose, porque les conviene a ambos. Pero eso no, todavía no lo sabemos. Pero sí sabemos que el efecto de la hembra es tremendo en el éxito reproductivo del macho. Entonces ella tiene mucha razón Y eso no lo hemos cuantificado todavía, del todo. Okay. Okay, I'm going to try to remember all that. So yeah, we need a bit. <laughs> uh, first, um, she agrees with you. Loretta agrees with you. So it's it might not be the best measure. Um, and then the reason behind it is because the reproductive success in males depends totally on what the, whatever the female does. So they measure. Um, they quantify the fitness of the males and it depends mostly on the male AG distance, but also on the number of effective uh, female partners that the male has had during the, the reproductive time. And so basically they're trying to disentangle these two things uh, to come up with a better measure for male fitness. But so far, it all depends on whatever the female does. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> uh, are there any other questions that people might have? I see Antonia has a hand raised. Hi. Um, I am a student of Adri. Um, I have a question about uh, how do you think the interactions between female phenotype and social environment in Dengus could influence population reproductive dynamic and the evolution of reproductive strategies in social mammal species? Adriana, I need help. <laughs> okay. Antonia, you can, you can say that in Spanish as well. <laughs> okay, gracias. Eh, ok, mi, mi pregunta es como, ¿de qué manera se cree que la interacción entre el fenotipo de las hembras y el entorno social en Dengu podría llegar a influir como en la dinámica reproductiva de la población y en la evolución de estrategias reproductivas en especies de mamíferos sociales? Um, voy a partir desde atrás, con la última parte de la pregunta. Eh, ok. Nosotros no, no hemos... evaluado este sistema de los distintos fenotipos de machos y hembra desde el punto de vista de las estrategias reproductivas, porque las estrategias reproductivas tienen base genética y son altamente heredables. En el caso de nuestra variación de fenotipos, lo que nosotros tenemos en la población, eh, nuestro rasgo es 90% o un poco más de 90% ambiental. Nosotros tenemos una heredabilidad muy baja de nuestro rasgo, entonces no nos hemos puesto a mirar esto desde el punto de vista de la evolución de las estrategias evolutivas alternativas, porque para eso requerimos de una base genética que sea importante y nosotros no tenemos eso. Eh, no, es, lo que, es un poco la respuesta a Karsten al principio. Eh, siempre van a existir individuos que puedan tener eh, bajo fitness, por ejemplo, en este caso los que tienen AGD corta, porque dado que el efecto es ambiental, 
solo basta con que un animal aleatoriamente esté en posición 0M, intra, en posición intrauterina 0M para tener distancia no genital corta. Y va a existir, aunque a lo mejor no tenga, eh, aunque a lo mejor le vaya mal en términos de eh, fitness. Pero este es un rasgo que es ambiental. En el fondo la selección natural no tiene tanto poder para eliminar a los fenotipos que son menos competitivos. Eso respondiendo a la primera parte. Y lo segundo es que nosotros hemos evaluado algo, no mucho, algo del efecto de los diferentes fenotipos o la proporción de fenotipos dentro del grupo social y hemos encontrado que aparentemente los individuos de aje de larga, tanto macho como hembras, tienen un efecto importante sobre los compañeros de grupo. Por ejemplo, les elevan los niveles de testosterona a los compañeros de grupo. Si eso es porque son individuos un poco más conflictivos a lo mejor, o porque son individuos reproductivamente mejores, no lo sabemos. Pero sí sabemos que los individuos de aje de larga parece que cumplen un rol dentro de los grupos porque afectan, eh, por ejemplo, los niveles de testosterona de los compañeros del grupo. Cuando estás con hembras o machos de aje de larga, los niveles de testosterona se tienden a elevar, tanto en los machos como en las hembras. O, o, o los niveles son más altos en realidad, más que tienden a elevar, son un poco más altos. Y bueno, los machos eh, también, el, los machos funcionan en relación a lo que hacen las hembras en los degus. Y pareciera que estar en grupos donde las hembras tienen la aje de larga es un poco más conveniente, dado que son hembras que además tienen mayor fertilidad. Ahora, nosotros también tenemos una variación en la frecuencia de los fenotipos a nivel de grupo y a nivel de población. Y es, de hecho, pareciera ser que los distintos morfotipos no son igualmente abundantes dependiendo de la densidad de la población. Y pareciera que cuando la densidad de la población es alta hay más individuos de aje de larga. Y pareciera que los individuos de aje de corta, tanto macho como hembra, son independientes de la densidad de la población. Pero eso es algo que recién estamos empezando a explorar. Entonces no tengo un, una respuesta concreta para esa parte de la pregunta. Perfecto, muchísimas gracias. I guess I'll try to translate all that first part of the question was uh related to uh, the evolution of alternative mating strategies uh but because the system and the anogenital distance variation is driven mostly uh or yeah it's driven mostly by environmental factors um there is not that much power of natural selection to act on this um and so there is no way to evaluate the evolution of alternative um, mating strategies in the system, at least not based on aging. And then for the second part of the question, was, which was related to uh, the potential effect of aging distance and uh, the social environment, um, what Loretto was explaining is that um, males with long age distance, they they have or play a role in the social groups because they can influence the testosterone levels of other members within the group. And so we don't know yet what's the mechanism that allowed this increment in the testosterone of the other males, uh, but that's what's happening. And um, I'm forgetting something else. And females part. also, females, uh, long AED females also influence in the testosterone levels of the male and female group mates. Okay, so there is an effect of the social group, and I would assume that it's a it's a bidirectional effect, like the AG of the particular male or female influencing the other individuals, and then because that can increase also um, the testosterone levels of other individuals. It might be affecting aggress aggression and um, that will change basically the phenotypic composition of the group. So um, that's, that's that part.
And I think I didn't, I'm not missing anything, right, Loreto? No, uh, only about uh, density, that um, um, depending on the population density also varies the frequency of the occurrence of different phenotypes. Uh, for example, in a high density condition, uh, there are more long AGD males and females. And short AGD males and short AGD females are independent of the density population. Um, I have a question of my own <laughs> since Please. there is no other question um, I, I'll do it in English and then uh, if you need my translation I can do it as well Loretto but um, you mentioned at the beginning that AG is uh, has a high repeatability but you also made a like a you highlighted that the male AG distance was even more repeatable than the female. Why would we expect not to see a high repeatability or why would you expect a low repeatability in this measurement? Could be like, in Spanish. Why is it so important for it to be repeatable or not repeatable? I think that is it's very important that repeatability uh, be high because uh, the 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 traits it's very safe to assess the 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 phenotype of the male and females. If you have a low repeatability, uh, low repeatability, it's not a very eh, a, um, no es un rasgo seguro como para poder evaluar eh, el fenotipo de los individuos. Ahora, en los machos es un poco más alto que en las hembras. O sea, la repetabilidad en general es bastante alta en los dos sexos, pero en los machos es un poco más alto que en las hembras. El rasgo es más consistente en los machos que en las hembras. Y eso también eh, es, está relacionado con nuestros cálculos de heredabilidad, porque nosotros en algún momento calculamos la heredabilidad de la AGD, pero cuando son recién nacidos y al destete. Y encontramos que la heredabilidad es bastante baja para los dos sexos, pero es un poco más alta en los machos que en las hembras. Y la repetibilidad, la repetibilidad y la heredabilidad están relacionadas. Si un rasgo es altamente repetible, también tiene un componente heredable, que es importante. Entonces, es un poco raro para mí esto, porque al momento del nacimiento y del destete, yo sé que la heredabilidad de la AGD es muy baja. Eso quiere decir que el componente ambiental es muy fuerte. Pero cuando nosotros medimos la AGD en estado adulto, tenemos una repetibilidad que es muy alta, que podría estar indicando también una heredabilidad muy alta. Pero nosotros no hemos medido la heredabilidad en el estado adulto. Pero sí es posible que la heredabilidad de un rasgo cambie durante la ontogenia. Y puede ser que a lo mejor este rasgo vaya aumentando el componente genético y vaya disminuyendo el componente ambiental. Pero eso no lo hemos medido porque no tenemos una medición de heredabilidad en estado adulto, pero sí un indicador de que puede ser alta dado que la repetibilidad es muy alta. Ok. Ok. So, basically, I'm going to try to translate all that into English. Um, so, it's good that it's highly repeatable because it's a safe Uh, it, it just gives us like a, a safe net to use this measure um, to look at this phenotype, basically. Um, but there is something that is interesting in the system and is that the heritability of the trait is high when, they, when they're just born and then at winning, which indicates that there is a high genetic component. But then when they measure this at the um, adult stage, they get high repeatability, but they don't have the data to estimate heritability at the um, adult stage. So, so far we don't know yet um, the genetic, what's the role of the genetic component in the system because we don't have the means but to measure heritability at the adult stage of this trait. Um, And I think that's basically what it's going on in the system. Hmm. 
Interesting. Um, I don't see any other questions. So, and it's such a small group now. Why don't we just, uh, how about I stop the live stream? We can continue chatting. Uh, so Loreto, thank you very much for a really great talk. Uh, and for joining us today and thanks for everyone next and for next week uh we have eve davidian will be giving her talk so please join us then